for best documentary film. So it's a really important film in terms of um, South African filmmaking, but also in terms we thought that it would be a, a good time to show it. If you were at, this, at the conference on Friday, I did mention the fact that it is 10 years since the Marikana massacre, which feels crazy, but it was 10 years ago on the 16th of August 2012, um, when the South African police did shoot at the 34 wine workers on strike at the Plaza Mine. So instead of only showing the film, we have um, as a guest today, uh, Benjamin Fogel. So I will just give a little introduction for Ben Fogel. Um, he's going to be providing context for the film today from the perspective of media specifically. Uh, so Benjamin Fogel is a historian. He's currently researching history of Brazilian anti-corruption politics as part of his PhD at New York University. Uh, he is from Cape Town and did his undergrad at Rhodes in politics before heading to NYU to do his PhD. But he's also a journalist and he's written extensively for local and international publications. He is a contributing editor at Jacobin Magazine, a leading publication on the American left, offering socialist perspective on politics, economics and culture, as well as a contributing editor at Africa is a Country. He's written extensively for international and local popular publications on a multitude of issues related to uh, South African and Brazilian politics, such as the labor movement, the transition, state capture, RET, and broad issues relating to understanding South African and Brazilian uh, politics and society. Shortly after the massacre in November 2012, Ben published a piece in Ceasefire magazine entitled The Selling of a Massacre media complicity in Marikana repression, which continues to be cited extensively in writing about Marikana now. And since 2012, he has continued to write and publish on the topic of Marikana, among other things, on various platforms. So you can follow him on Twitter, at Benjamin Fogel, for any anti-RET um, content, as well as uh, current updates on Brazilian politics. So, Thank you very much, Ben, for agreeing to join us at our seminar series to introduce the film. Um, thinking you can speak for 15, 20 minutes or okay. as much as you'd like, and then and then we'll show the film. So not as much as you'd like, so because we're still yeah. going to show the film. <laughs> um, and also just uh, just to say, obviously, the film is is uh, sensitive content, but I think um, it's important for us to watch to understand. Our stuff. <coughs> Thank you. Ben Fogel. Thanks for that introduction. Um, so I'll get started. Uh, in August 2012, I was an honors student at Rhodes University uh, studying politics, and I was actually in Cape Town. I remember this very distinctly where I was. I was in Seapoint, I think, a restaurant when uh, the massacre updates kept on coming in. Because, you know, it was literally like five people shot, then nine people shot, then the numbers kept going on and on, and then eventually it was 34 dead. And immediately my response was, this is very abnormal. This is way more than uh, one would expect in you know, typical police repression or even uh, strike breaking violence, even in a country with a long history of violent labor relations. Something had abnormal, something that had really changed the paradigm had happened. And, um, but it wasn't treated as such. Um, I'll get into this. I mean. Part of my uh, experience of Marika, and I think it really does stay, have a lot to uh, say about where we are today in South Africa, is the sort of lack of outrage afterwards. And what do I mean by that? Uh, there were no significant solidarity protests in South Africa or you know, demonstrations against police violence. There was a march of maybe 60 people in Cape Town that was there at. Um, and that's not particularly significant. Um, the institutions that you would expect to take this cause up, namely the trade union movement, uh, to an extent, uh, <laughs> reproduced the justification for the massacre. Uh, so if you look at the NUM, the National Union Mind Worker statements at the time, if you look at the Casato statements, even to the point of uh, that Congress later that year, which really led to the split of the trade union federation later, if you look at um, what we would call civil society or NGOs, it was a very muted reaction. I mean, the first significant public figure I remember going to Marikana was Julius Malema. 
uh, actually it might have been Bantu Halomisa, but those are the two first uh, two significant figures, but you know, the people who are given more status as moral voice in society, including many organizations which have been speaking about police violence or corruption or inequality in South Africa, but not to be silent uh, about Marikana. And then even more uh, so, we looked at the media. And this is not a massacre that occurred behind closed doors, even if the majority of killings occurred off screen. The media had been covering the strike. There had been 10 people killed in the lead up to the massacre. Uh, before August 16th, and a lot of the violence was live on television. There were film crews there. This is not something which was hidden. But yet, curiously speaking, you found the reproduction of justifications for the massacre completely overwhelmingly predominant in the media. And in fact, it took many years, I would argue, it took um, for this narrative about what occurred to change from these were a sort of savage horde of mutant mooted up, frenzied, striking workers, brandishing weapons who had killed people, to this was something, a police operation, which had aimed to kill them. I mean, they'd set mortuary vans, they had stockpiled live ammunition. This was not something where we know there was, you know, random occurrence. But, um, of course, the first uh, investigative journalists that uh, broke the story of what sort of really went down for the Daily Maverick, uh, particularly Greg Marinovich, uh, his work. But even if that made a dent in some public perceptions, overwhelmingly, and I think this is part of the sort of strategy that commissions of inquiry do, is they postpone dealing with the question of what really transpired. We can't comment as a trade union, as a society organization, as a political party or uh, expert until we have conclusive proof from the commission and everyone who's studied commissions knows knows that's not exactly what commissions have historically produced. They produce uh, something which delays, defers, rather than offers conclusive results. Now, this movie, uh, I think more than any other single media product, did a lot to change people's public consciousness. I've seen this movie uh, many times. Uh, it has, uh, I kind of have not watched so much of it now because I've seen it too many times, it's kind of brutal. But it is an important movie to watch, but Everybody who I have seen who has seen this movie, regardless of what their perception of what transpired and Marikana beforehand, has had their mind changed. In that, you, you can see it really offers a good background of how to understand the very the specifics of what occurred uh, in Marikana. Now, the other thing about the Marikana massacre, which is also not spoken enough in the narratives, you know, even the narratives that acknowledge it was a uh, massacre rather than when it was speaking to akin to some sort of natural tragedy that could not be avoided, which is often how these things are referred to, is that it's only the beginning of the story. The consequences of Marikana <coughs> continue to reverberate across South African politics. Oh, I mean, for instance, the, the other thing, the one sector that, and one group of people uh, that did actually offer solidarity in the wake of the massacre was the mine workers of the platinum belt themselves. Immediately after the massacre, one of the largest uh, wildcat strikes in South African history occurred, in which effectively all the mines across the Rustenburg platinum belt area, you know, the heart of our mineral energy complex, was shut down by workers. It also triggered the mass defection of workers from the NUM, of course, the union that our current president was famously uh, a leader of. And of course, there is his role in the massacre of, as a director of Lonman, putting emails out to crack down the strike. But that aside, um, the NUM lost its hold in the platinum belt to a large extent. It leaked members. We, it's never really recovered. And Pisatu, to an extent, has never really recovered in the private sector after the massacre. But the workers migrated to another union, AMCU. And now the reason that the workers migrate to that union is at the core of what went, happened in the Marikana massacre is where effectively the shop stewards, the leaders of the NUM at the Longman, at Longman would not take up the demands of workers. In fact, they would sided with the bosses and were unresponsive to the point of deploying violence against their own uh, constituency. And AMCU, unlike the NUM, were willing to uh, take up these demands. And this leads to the longest strike in South African history in 2014, 2015, six months, which ultimately the strike was won, but 
but even for today, what exactly the conditions are in the platinum belt in terms of uh, the conditions are pretty dire. The workers are still in a very bad state. The communities are still have not received uh, either justice or improved service delivery, which is a question of what's changed. And political violence still overwhelmingly dominates labor relations. There. And uh, at least 20 uh, people, um, are, people have been murdered in political uh, assassinations in this region connected to uh, the So you can view it as an ongoing process. Now, bring us back to media. So it's worth asking, uh, still asking to this day, why for a media which you know plays a watchdog role and has played such an important role in exposing the wrongdoing of, of the state from uh, state capture, arms deal, we have many different things that we can point to, uh, was so unresponsive in the wake of Marikana. Now, uh, one could point, of course, to the reproduction of colonial narratives about, you know, uh, black African savagery and the working class, which is really reproducing this narrative around Muti. Uh, the one thing was there was a Sangoma who got them all frenzied up and told them they would be invulnerable to bullets if so they put a cream on them. There was another one about a rabbit that had magical powers. There was all this flagrantly nonsense. Even if like there are some gomas in there, most of the time you would say like, hey, if I'm going on a difficult strike, I'll take any luck I can get. But this is the whole, and again, you know, the cold conditions were people were not being paid well, people were dying, and communities were very much screwed. Like London had not fulfilled its social responsibility obligations as part of the mining shop. But you see that, then you see, you know, the police were under threat. They were facing a charge of people with weapons. And again, if you it's really mis if you look at the documentary, it clearly establishes that's not exactly what happened. And uh, you have uh, other things that like the workers who are just completely being misled by AMCU. Most of the workers who were striking were not members of AMCU. AMCU, in fact, uh, Joseph Mutunjwa, the AMCU uh, general secretary, actually goes to the workers and you see it in the documentary and implores them to you know, abandon this effort to find a peaceful resolution. And you have this thing, which I don't think is pointed out enough. And if you really want to understand why Kisatu is in the current crisis, it is, this kind of clarifies it, is that the majority of the police who were there at that day who murdered workers were members of the same trade union federation as the workers were killed. They were still members of the NUM, and these were members of the pop crew. So I'll leave that to you too. From your conclusions. My own view is the failing in terms of the media and the reason why it reproduced the state justifications for the massacre and also to an extent uh, what we call the NGO driven civil, uh, civil society comes down to uh, reckoning with a, something that had gone terribly wrong with South Africa which destabilized narratives or understandings about the country. What do I mean by this? If you look at it, I view 2012 in retrospect as you know the end of this period in which South Africa was presented as a sort of plucky nation moving forward for all our faults and generally stumbling along in the right direction. The sort of exceptionalist narrative of South Africa is generally getting better. And since 2012, uh, we have a country which is poorer, more violent, uh, less capacitated state. Uh, things have got materially worse. You can look at the GDP per capita has declined since 2012. So what does this say? It says, it said that uh, we have to rethink our ways we interact with the state that will murder people and then do what it can to cover it up. We are not dealing with an uh, interlocutor, which is in a good faith. We're not dealing with a country which, you know, we have accountability institutions which function. And you've clearly <laughs> seen often aftermath that they didn't function, and which is ultimately a self fulfilling prophecy in some respects. And it's also a question of power. You know, if you rely on the legal mechanisms, the mechanisms of uh, formal institutions to deliver uh, accountability, you're going to be limited in terms of being able to deploy uh, consequences for such an action. And uh, I think this moment, if we want to understand why in many other tragedies and things have also occurred from last year's July insurrection, the many other instances of police brutality or state negligence leading to deaths. 
the it, I sometimes because I haven't been in South Africa for much of this period looking from afar is why isn't there more collective outrage? Why are organizations do not have the power to deploy in order to uh, produce political consequences rather than getting some sort of legal victory, which doesn't really result in much in terms of uh, transformative change? You have to look at this reaction to this moment. And I think it says that the trade unions failed in terms of looking after the interests of their workers. The um, capital did not fulfill its end of the bargain, the supposed social contract rights. Uh, the state did not enforce mining regulations to provide uh, a, better, a better life for all in this key strategic sector, which also follows uh, the commodity boom. This is the industry which was responsible for a lot of South Africa's GDP growth um, in the 2000s. And then we have a media which in large part didn't ask important questions after the massacre. In fact, the people were not looking at the sites except for Greg Marinovich and some researchers. They did not go and even speak to many of the workers. Uh, in that article from 2012, you can see it that like basically three workers are interviewed and everyone else is from the states in terms of uh, hundreds of articles that have been written in this period. And this is really stark. It really revealed something was not functioning. And I'm not somebody who, uh, unlike some people out there these days, who seems to think that investigative journalism is some sort of CIA conspiracy, who wants to go beat up on the media, want to rather understand, because again, the media, including this, in the, this film, as well as independent researchers, did uncover what happened and uh, help change the narrative. It's more understanding the limitations and uh, some of the lessons from that moment. Now, uh, I'll just end with a couple of remarks about this film. Is This film took, many, I think it appeared once on uh, South African television, but uh, it was sort of blocked from appearing on television for a long period of time, despite winning an Emmy, which is a pretty significant award. And normally everyone wants to celebrate South Africans winning something internationally. It's a film by people who have deep political involvement and had some history working in this region and just so happened to be there at the time. Um, it's also a film which gives you a good lesson how to present an argument in terms of uh, making a statement. And I think viewing, uh, there's probably a research paper for someone else out there to understand the narratives of the massacre before and after this film, or the mother's thesis or something like that. But now we're in 10 years after the massacre and None of the people really responsible for it have been held properly accountable. We have a president who's implicated, uh, even if he's not didn't directly pull the trigger, there's serious presence beyond spouse conduct during the massacre. But at the same time, we have a faction, the RET faction, the Project Zoom faction, who have weaponized this narrative uh, of um, Ramaphosa's response to Marikana with by, with by uh, neglecting the very important fact that Jacob Zuma was president at the time, or also wasn't even deputy president. So, I mean, you have this classic thing of the state saying, uh, the ANC rather, saying, we're in power, but we're not in power. So we can actually join the solidarity movement of something that we directly implicated. And this is something which you see very clearly in how uh, the post bell Pottinger public sphere has weaponized Marikana as a political tool, which is not about the workers, or not about people who are actually responsible for it, but for factional ANC strife. And I think this is something that you will see deployed uh, this weekend, even if uh, I think mostly it'll be sort of ignored or played down or waxed lyrical upon, but you will see this emerge, that uh, Marikana will be, again, one of the many sticks used and up wielded in the run up to uh, our climatic electoral conference in the year of legacy. Uh, with that, uh, with those thoughts out there, uh, I think the movie is very effective and I think we should also still be asking these questions now about what did Marikana say about the basic institutions of our democracy and why didn't they produce the sort of response we would have hoped for if we were a more deep-rooted and strong democracy. Thank you.
you. Thanks so much, Ben, for that introduction. And now I will um, switch to the film. Um, it's about about an hour and a half. I know people might have to get to various things, but we'll have a bit of time for discussion if, afterwards if you're able to stay. Um, should I turn the, the light? Just doing it for. Um, since uh, this massacre, um, I think just kind of raising public consciousness to the, the gravity of, of what it was um, and what it means and was important. Um, and maybe just to, to say that there, there will be some. Some things happening in the next week or two around Cape Town, um, UCT, um, some people from UCT has done an installation um, of sort of the crosses, which they've had in a few years in a row um, as you kind of come into UCT and there's an exhibition on uh, the 15th um, at the Center for African Studies. There will also be um, some screenings happening, one of which being this film, but also another called Strike a Rock, which is written, uh, which is um, done about the, the widows of Marikana and the activism that has grown since um, in the incoming settlement. Um, and then there's also a, an event uh, that um, Benjamin and myself and uh, William Shockey, a, a writer at Africa is a country, and Sean Jacobs have um, put together, which is going to be on the 20th of August on, at Constitution Hill, um, with various speakers, including our Stellenbosch's um, Pumla, Prof. Pumla Gaboro Matikizela, it will be a keynote, as well as Ronnie Castro's. Um, uh, we've invited speakers such as Zianda Stearman, Kalp uh, Kamalita Naika from, from UCT, um, and various, uh, and also Muzo um, Kolo Magidiwana, and one of the strike leaders featured in the film. Um, and one of the survivors. Um, so it will be streamed as well. So, um, yeah, if you'd like to be involved in that way, that would be great. But I think I'll just stop there. Um, thanks for coming. Um, and yeah, I'll just leave it there. Thank you, Ben, for, for doing the introduction. Plus, um, unless someone else would like, would like to say anything.